Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining us online. We're so honored that we can be together in these moments. Thank you for the privilege of having us in your home today. You know, all across our church, we continue to hear stories of how God is doing just incredible things in the lives of our people. Small example, but I just felt it would encourage us today. There's an amazing lady in our church. She had to take her kid to the dentist the other day. They finished the work. The bill came. It was 600 rand. She had to pay it, but really didn't have the money to pay it at all. Wondered how they were going to make it through. Well, guess what? The moment she got home, she found 600 rand in an envelope under her door, slid under her door. Just goes to show God sees us in the big things and the small. He sees you, he sees your situation, and he is good. Let's continue to trust him. And I want to encourage you, as God does something in your life, keep sharing the stories on the Thrive app. The Thrive app is literally just Thrive in your pocket. So keep sharing and let's keep encouraging each other. Hey, and speaking of encouragement, our church online platform is being viewed all over South Africa, pretty much from all of the major metropolitan areas in our country, as well as overseas into America, Australia, New Zealand, England, and afar. Our church, Thrive, has never had a bigger reach. Thanks so much for your generosity, your investment, and your sacrificial giving, and for spreading the word, for inviting family and friends. Every person that's helped makes a difference. So I want to start today by asking one of the central questions of life. It is a question that all of us, we must during our lifetime, be able to answer. The question is simply this. What is the most important thing about God? What is the most important thing about God? I mean, is it his character, his power, his love, his care, his mystery, his grace? Is it his silence? Is it his timing? I want to suggest that for us, perhaps the most important thing about God is what we believe about him. Now, the reason I say this is because what we believe about God determines how we see God. What we believe about God determines how we see Him. And how we see God determines everything about our life. It determines how we approach Scripture, how we pray. It determines how we respond to God and what questions we ask of Him. And ultimately, perhaps most importantly, it determines how close our relationship with God is. It determines how we think about the world, how we deal with the poor and injustice. It literally affects everything. In short, what we believe about God is the lens through which we see God. You know, when I put on different lenses, I see things differently. Different lens, different view. If I take off these glasses and put on others, for example, these red things, not only do I look different to you now, but you look different to me. Why? Because I'm seeing you through the lens of these glasses. Similarly, if I had to put these on, these have got a totally different lens to my normal glasses. I can barely see you at this moment because uh, these aren't my usual glasses. I've got a different lens in and so I'm seeing the world differently. It doesn't matter which glasses I put on, it doesn't matter which lens I use, each lens is different and the lens that is there is going to determine how I see the world. Different lens, different view, right? That's the point. Different lens equals a different view. Well, so too with God. Depending upon the lens that we look through, our view of Him will differ. I think there are four big prevailing lenses through which our culture views God. First, there's the lens of a distant God. That God is distant, far away, somewhat unknowable. He's at a distance, someplace far away, watching our world, watching us. He's there, we are here, but He's distant and uninvolved. Secondly, there's the lens of an angry God. You know, God is some angry cosmic power. He's upset and angry with mankind and his sort of judgment is just hanging over our heads. And sometime in the future, he's going to judge everyone and it's going to be terrible. Thirdly, there's the lens of an irrelevant God. He just doesn't make much sense and he doesn't make much difference to our lives. And whether he's real or not is actually irrelevant. My life is my own and he doesn't really affect my life much anyway. Or fourthly, there's the lens of a genie God. You know, I believe in God, but God is a kind of cosmic genie that I pray to whenever I have a need to answer my wishes. Almost like a vending machine. I go to it when I need something. Put in a prayer, and out comes something that I've prayed for. 
So we must ask what these views in our culture and where these views come from. Well, much of the time, you know, they come from how we relate it to our earthly fathers. So if our earthly father was distant and uninvolved, well, we can take that naturally into our view of God. If our father was angry and judgmental, well, then that's often how we can see God too. Or if our father was irrelevant and didn't make much difference in our lives at all, well, then that's how we can perceive God. And it happens unknowingly. If our father was someone we simply went to to fill a need, a kind of a vending machine dad, then that's how we'll see God. But you know, church, God had a different lens in mind for us. So today, come with me on a journey. Let's go right back to the beginning, to Genesis. First book of the Bible, to the moment when God formed us, created us, breathed life into us. The very first story of God and mankind. Because it's actually the story that casts light on every other story. And this is the story through which we have to view every other story in Scripture. If we understand this one right, we'll understand every other one more fully. It's a story found in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Starts from verse 26. Then God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. They'll reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, the livestock, all the wild animals on the earth and small animals that scurry along the ground. So God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Watch this in verse 28. Then God blessed them. And said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Let's pause there for a minute, church. I want to start painting this picture for us. God created mankind out of love. The Trinity, the God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, were so full of love that they wanted to share that love. It could not be contained and that's why they created mankind. Simply to share their love. Not for us to serve them as some kind of slave. Not for us to be a cosmic toy to play with. But simply so they could lavish love upon us. Got it? So let's continue. Verse 31 then of that same chapter. Then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. Let's stop, pause quickly, just for a moment more. The very first thing God calls us is good. Not evil, not sinful, not shameful, not broken, not a mess and not a mess up. He calls us good. Let that sink in. And so the story continues to build. We see that he's pleased with us. But more than that, we see that God and man walked and interacted together. So let's continue our journey into Genesis 3, verse 8 and 9. It says that when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? This text shows the climax of the creation story before the fall of mankind. It tells the story of how God would walk with Adam and Eve in the cool evening breezes every evening. Every evening they would walk and talk and be with each other. But this one evening God came looking for them when they didn't show up. Why? Because man and God had a friendship. There is one word above any other that could summarize how God has always wanted to relate to us. In other words, one lens through which we must understand God. One lens that is above every other, and it's the lens we must see Him through. It's the lens called friend. God had a friendship with Adam and Eve. Every day they'd walk and talk, and the evening breezes, they would walk, talk, and share their lives. Find out how their day was, what they'd been thinking about, what they'd been doing, you know? Each day they would meet to share their lives as close, intimate friends. So here's the story. God, in an act of pure love, creates us. The reason He created us was to love us. He looks upon us, at His creation. The pinnacle of his creative love and he says it's good. The closest I can come to knowing how God must feel when he looks at us is the feeling I experienced when Caitlin and Caleb, our kids, were born. Listen, the strength of love that rushes at a parent 
when they hold their newborn baby for the first time is the most powerful emotion I've ever experienced. I, I can remember the day when the doctor handed each of our kids to me to hold for the first time. I wasn't sure if my heart would melt or burst or explode or all of it at once. The strength of that love was almost suffocating. It was so strong. And so God in love with us, his creation, every evening would walk with his friends, Adam and Eve. They walked and talked simply to enjoy each other. Here's the thought. You and I were created by God simply to be loved by God, to be his friends. We were created to be his friends for a deep, caring, intimate, loving friendship with him. And when we start at the beginning, right back to God's intended plan, we see that friendship was first and foremost on his mind. And where our problem begins is that we've lost and forgotten that original lens of friendship. And sometimes the problem is the gospel, the good news, gets explained to us in this way. It goes like this. Mankind messed up. In fact, Romans 3.23 says that we all have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God. So Jesus came to make that right. He died for you so that you don't have to have God's punishment upon you. Simply accept him and you will go to heaven. Now, each of these statements in and of themselves is correct. But they're also incomplete and they start in the wrong place. We did mess up. We did sin. Jesus did come to make that right. But that's not where the story starts. And that's what I'm saying to us today. The story starts way back in Genesis 2 with a creation, with God calling it good. And again, before the temptation and fall in Genesis 3, God would walk with his friends in the evening. God had a friendship with us long before Satan appeared. And that's the starting point to the gospel. Long before there was trouble in paradise, there was paradise. We were made for intimate friendship with God. And that's why the gospel is good news. Because it's about the fact that a loving God gave up and sacrificed his obedient son in order to restore the friendship that was lost. That same love that compelled him to create us now compelled him to rescue us. The gospel is good news because it's about the restoration of something beautiful that was lost. And that something beautiful is friendship. It's not about an angry God who wants to see bloodshed to appease and placate his anger at sin. The gospel is about a loving God wanting his friends back. And that's why Jesus told the story of the prodigal son to illustrate what God is like. A father waiting for the return of the child that he desperately misses. And when he comes home, there's no revenge, there's no getting even, there's no pep talk, there's no anger, there's just pure joy. Jesus echoes the heart of his father and reinforces this when he says to his disciples in John 15, 15, you guys are my friends. I no longer call you slaves because a master doesn't confide in his slaves. No, you are my friends since I've told you everything the father told me. See, when we view God as a loving father friend, this affects everything about our lives. It affects how and why we pray. We pray not to get something from God. We pray because we're his friends. We pray not fearful or wondering whether we've lived up to his standard, to his mark, wondering whether we're good enough to pray. We pray as if we're talking to a father friend. It affects how we see and approach scripture. We read it knowing now that the entire story, everything we read, is about this big story of God wanting to restore his friendship with us. A time with God in the morning or evening becomes now a time of friendship, not just some chore that we think we have to do to please God. It also affects how we relate to other people. We can love others because we deeply loved ourselves. We, we ourselves experience what it means to be loved, not because we've earned it, but simply because God loved us. And so we can learn to give that love to others too as a gift. We learn to love others not because they're good, but because we have been loved un unconditionally ourselves. It affects our friendships. See, when we understand that our primary relationship in life is friendship with God, then we understand that we were created first and foremost for intimate friendship. Then we can start to become the sort of friend that we want to be to other people. 
At this time, we have to be careful, church, that we don't abandon friendships and community. Because if we do, we can easily become selfish, self-absorbed, self-indulgent. We were made for friendship and for community. And we are online a lot at the moment. And the temptation is to say, I don't feel like being online more. I'm, I'm not going to do community because I'm tired of being online. And community at the moment is more online time. Well, being online after a long day online already is a sacrifice. But you know, Christ followers all throughout history have always made huge sacrifices to be together. Christ followers have risked their lives and risked torture to be together. This is a season where we must sacrifice to be together. We have to decide to sacrifice to engage online because community matters and friendship matters. We were made first for friendship. So if we give up that sacred opportunity of coming together, we give up part of who we are. And the consequences of that are devastating. We can easily become lonely, disconnected, isolated, weak in our faith. We can lose hope and purpose. We can stop growing. We can stagnate simply because we're not engaging the way God designed us to be. We must sacrifice to be part of community. Well, this is a season where we have to sacrifice. We have to decide to sacrifice to engage online because community matters. Friendship matters. Even if it's online and we've been online the whole day already, it really matters. You see, we were made first for friendship. And so, guys, if we give up that sacred opportunity of coming together, we give up a part of who we are. And the consequences of that can be devastating. We can easily become lonely and disconnected, isolated, weak in our faith. We, we can lose hope and purpose. We can stop growing, stagnate, simply because we're not functioning as God designed us to. And because we're not prepared to sacrifice to be a part of a community. Speaking of community and friendship, this week we launch our online college community. Nine incredible courses to help us move towards Jesus. Something for everyone. You can sign up on the app, on the Thrive app, or on our website. And the course content is going to be there for you to learn from and engage at your own pace and in your own time on Google Classroom. And then once a week, we're going to come together for an hour virtually to encourage each other and to learn from each other. So college is going to be an awesome mix of Google Classroom and Zoom. Own work at our own time and in our own pace, coming together on Zoom to encourage each other, strengthen each other for an hour a week. So we can go through this time growing stronger, or we can go through this time growing stale, growing lonely, growing isolated, growing grumpy. The choice is ours. Hey? When we view God as friend, you see it affects every part of our lives, even our ability and willingness to do online community and friendship. What's the application for us today? It's simply this. Ask yourself honestly, what's my view of God? If I'm really honest, I know I can think of God sometimes as distant or angry or irrelevant or at times a genie ready to grant my wish. But today God would want to remind us that the first thing he called us was good. And the first relationship we ever had with him was friendship. And God's heart through the death of Jesus was to restore that friendship. Think of this today. How different would your world look if you really grasped today that God wants more than anything else to be friends with you, to walk in the garden again with you? That's why he created you and me. He's not distant, angry, or on the irrelevant sidelines, nor does he want to simply be a genie in our pocket. No, he wants to be friends. Friends is the primary lens we look through when we see God. You know, the night before Jesus was executed, he did something remarkable. Again, he echoed, copied his father. He asked his friends, his disciples, to walk with him in a garden. But this was not a garden of paradise. This was a garden of suffering. Not the garden of Eden, but the garden of Gethsemane. And of course, that garden led directly to the cross and to his sacrifice. So here's the thing. Jesus entered the garden of suffering so we could re-enter the garden of friendship. He said that again. Jesus entered the garden of suffering so we could re-enter the garden of friendship. So we could find our way back to friendship with God. Right before he entered the garden of suffering, he established something new. A new era of friendship. How he did that was by allowing his body to be broken and his blood to be shed for the forgiveness of our sins. 
So when we take communion, we eat of the bread and drink the grape juice as a reminder that his body was broken for us. His blood was shed for us because he loved us so much that he wanted to restore the friendship. When we remember Jesus' work on the cross, we remember that it's the bridge that takes us back to the original garden of friendship. So today, let's take communion together. Let's take firstly the bread and remember that this represents his body broken for us. As we do so, let's pray. Jesus, thank you that you loved us so much that you wanted a friendship with us to allow yourself to be broken for us. And today as we take the cup of grape juice, we remember this symbolizes and signifies his blood shed for us on the cross. Why? So that there could be forgiveness of our sin. Let's drink together. Jesus, we're so grateful for your sacrifice. We're so thankful for it. We're thankful that you allowed your body to be broken, your blood shed, for the forgiveness of our sins, so that your body could be a bridge back to the garden of friendship. For those of you watching today who may not have ever started a friendship with God, I want to say this to you. Friendship with God is one decision away today. Jesus said that he stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. Whoever hears and opens the door, invites him in, he will come in and dine with him or her, and, and they with him. In other words, the friendship will start immediately today. Which means that if you and I are open to Jesus, we can open up the door of our hearts and we can invite him in, and we can begin our journey and our friendship with him now, in this moment. I would love the opportunity and the great privilege of praying. And as I do so, I want to invite you to pray with me today. This is a prayer especially for those of you who are making a decision in this moment to invite Jesus into your life. Father, thank you so much for your goodness and your love and your grace. Thank you that you desire more than anything else a friendship with us. Jesus, thank you that you were obedient to your Father's wishes, sacrificed yourself. Let your body be broken and your blood shed all so that we could restore the friendship with our Father God who desires to be a father and a friend to us. Today I want to say thank you for your sacrifice. I want to open my life to you and invite you into my life. I want to make a decision to follow you, Jesus, not simply as a savior who will help me get to heaven, but as a Lord who will lead my life. In this moment, I'm responding to you and saying, I want to follow you. Thank you for your goodness and your grace. Would you forgive my sin? And would you begin to start a new chapter, write a new story with my life? In Jesus' name, amen. Today, if you prayed that prayer with us, I want to let you know it is the very best decision you could ever have made. And it is a huge day for you. We'd love to celebrate with you. We want you to know that all around our church, Thrive Church, in every home right now, people are cheering for you. They're cheering you on behind computer screens and TVs, tablets and phones. Thrive Church is cheering you on. We would be so honored and we'd love for you to let us know that you made that decision by either clicking on the raise hand in the bottom right of your screen right now or by simply WhatsApping the words, follow Jesus to the number on the screen that's appearing there right now. We'd love to send you something helpful, simply by WhatsApp, to get you started on your faith journey. Thanks for joining us today, everybody. My hope, my prayer for us all today is that we would know that the main lens, the, the first lens, the primary lens through which we view God is that of friend. He wants a friendship with you and I. He did everything he could to restore that friendship. It's a game changer for us. When we view God as friend, it changes everything. Pray that you would all have an amazing week. As we continue to move towards Jesus, let's be with him, become like him, do what he did. Grace and peace, everyone. Have a fantastic week ahead.